Let me um, quickly give you a perspective of where we've been in this course so far. We've covered five, six weeks of material, and I want you to see why we're looking at membranes at this particular point in time. So, so far, we've looked at um, sedimentation. We started that. Those are large particles that are settling under gravity in, in a separation vessel. And then what we did is we, after finishing that topic, there was sort of like a side diversion where we looked at particle size distributions. And I did this for two reasons. One is because I know it's not covered anywhere else in the undergraduate curriculum and it's an important topic. But secondly, we have to start recognizing that any separation process we deal with, sedimentation, centrifuges, cyclones, we never have a single particle size coming in. And so we have to be aware of that distribution and how to describe it. But then we sort of came back to our topic here and we looked at centrifuges for a few lectures. Centrifuges essentially take the gravitational force under sedimentation and we step that up artificially by providing an ESA and spinning the device around. And after centrifuges, I would have typically looked at cyclones at that point, but because I was away and Kushlani started the filtration topic, um, we did that first. And then we came from filtration over to cyclones. It didn't really matter that we switched them around, but typically I would just follow that approach. What filtration does differently to a centrifuge is it now adds a medium to the system. So we've got a mass separating agent being added. Cyclones kind of fit somewhere in between. There's, uh, we don't spin anything around. We provide the ESA as, as a pressure drop. But what we need to do is sometimes be aware of where cyclones fit into the picture. And there was an earlier slide, I believe it was back in, was it under centrifuges? Yeah, under the centrifuge topic. So you, don't, you obviously don't have this in slide in front of you, but it's back in slide 30 under centrifuges. You might want to make a note in your notes to cross-reference over that. And this is a nice diagram because it explains where everything fits. So where everything fits is primarily along this horizontal axis, which is the terminal settling velocity under gravity. Um, so other than this factor of two, which you can ignore, essentially the horizontal axis is the terminal settling velocity under gravity, which again, for a given fluid with a given viscosity and density and a given solid um, density, Essentially, we can remap this x-axis to particle size. Okay? And in some textbooks, they show it that way. The horizontal axis is particle size. So smallest particle sizes over here, larger particle sizes over there. And what this shows is that for larger particle sizes, if we found ourselves in this region, we would use a sedimentation vessel or a gravity tank. So moderate throughputs. So meters cubed per hour that you need to treat. And what this shows is that as you need to treat larger and larger volumes, so think large scale wastewater treatment, municipal wastewater treatment, you've got a very high meters cubed per hour that you need to treat. And large particle sizes, a sedimentation vessel would be appropriate. You can get away with the sedimentation vessel at smaller particle sizes, provided your throughput requirements are smaller. Because okay? otherwise what you end up building is, a, is an unreasonably large sedimentation vessel. So for small treatment volumes and smaller particle sizes, a sedimentation vessel is still appropriate. But after a point, gravity doesn't provide any help for you anymore. And then you need to start moving to cyclones and centrifuges. And that's what's shown over here. So here's a hydrocyclones, or cyclones is just is the same name for the, for the device. Basket type centrifuges, scroll type centrifuges, disc and tubular bowl centrifuges all have their space up over there. And then for really small particle sizes, but very small treatment volumes, we can use lab scale centrifuges. 
Okay, so this plot gives you an idea of where you should be using different types of equipment. People often ask that at this point in the course is how do I know to pick a cyclone versus a centrifuge? And this plot gives you that guidance. Okay. Now we're going to start looking at membranes. Membranes are a way to separate even smaller particle sizes still. And membranes start to fall in this region and even that gap that's over there. Okay. So we'll see that coming up in the membrane topic. In fact, membranes will also work when you cannot see the solids. The solids in these devices are separate from the liquid phase or from the fluid phase. With membranes, we can even separate solids which are entirely dissolved. So there's no, we're not using the principle of a density difference or a size of the molecule anymore. We can, with membranes, in fact, separate particles that are entirely dissolved in the fluid phase. So that's where that's, this starts to deviate from the material we've looked at the past five weeks can be summarized on this plot. Membrane starts to deviate from that point. Okay. So let's um, switch gears then to the membrane notes. If you have them with you, they were posted on the site uh, yesterday. <clears throat> And um, perhaps just before we, we talk about membranes, um, for those of you that downloaded the notes, you probably noticed this slide in there, which is a mistake. Um, it was the project topic from last year, so ignore this slide, please. But I do want to talk at this point about the project. Um, this is the point in the course where I always introduce the project, is just as we finish um, cyclones and filtration and moving into membranes, I, I always have the project coming in at this point. I'll post a formal description of the project to the, uh, to the course website. I'm just working on some finalizing uh, a detail or two still. But let me just talk about it in general terms. There will be, will be multiple project topics where you get to pick. You don't need to email me or anything. You just pick the topic of your choice. Uh, last year, those were the four topics that the class chose from. Uh, this year, I, I don't have a challenge project, so ignore that. But there will be about three to four projects available. I do also want to mention that um, for all project topics, no matter what topic you end up picking, um, I've posted now for a while on the course website, and I hope you'll consider this today, is um, the Water Week posters on campus. So. It's the water week on campus, the entire week. We've had people visiting from a variety of water companies on campus. But today um, is the water week poster presentation. And there's 60 posters in the student center. And they're av available from 2.30 to 4.30 this afternoon. Now, for extra credit for the project, you can attend that poster presentation and your goal is to interview one person and write a half a page summary and the questions I'd like you to ask the interviewer is, um, are posted on the course website right on the front page. So I've had that there for about a week now uh, for you to, to look at. If you're not aware of it yet now, I hope you see hearing it now. Um, and it, it's just a chance to get a little bit of extra credit for the course project, where you go interview someone and ask them about the technology, about water treatment that they've considered in their poster. So there's 60 people presenting posters. Um, you can find anyone that, there that you'd like to talk with. Okay. Any questions on that? So far, no? Okay, so as I said, the projects will be posted. It's a very short 10-page write-up that you'll need to uh, submit by by November, but, uh, and, the, and the exact topics and the details around the project I'll, I'll release very soon. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at membranes here. So I, how many of you have done the membrane lab? Yeah? Anyone not done the membrane lab yet? Okay, so a few of you um, haven't. I will bring a membrane to class um, next time. I, I'm, I'm just looking at getting it still. It's, um, so you can actually see what this looks like. 
visually, it's, um, it, we'll, we'll see lots of photos coming up here, but here's examples of, of some of them rolled up over here, or a hollow fiber membrane as shown over there. So water passes through this, it essentially looks like a drinking straw, um, and will pass through that membrane. Now, what I like to have people do before we launch into this topic is I'm going to pass some papers around and have you write and brainstorm on the paper anything and everything you know about membranes. Now, for some of you, that might be might be fairly low amount, but some of you might know quite a bit. Some of you have even done co-op jobs and work terms in water treatment companies. So I'm going to give you five minutes. And this is an important exercise because whenever we're learning something, a good way to benchmark your, your knowledge and what you're about to learn is to record what you know already. And then I'm going to have you repeat this exercise a few weeks later, and you can track your imp improvement or increase in knowledge, okay? So I'm gonna ask you to submit this to me. I don't want your names on here, but if you'd like to compare like a before and after, just take a photo of the page uh, with your cell phone camera for your own records uh, just before you submit it. So giving you five minutes, write down everything you know about membranes. So there's this exact question is going to be up here. If I don't have enough papers, um, just use your own notebooks and may not have quite enough paper here. So if you guys have um, paper from your own notebooks, that would be appreciated, sorry. <clears throat> Okay, so for example, you might write membranes, and the first thing you know is that it's used for water treatment. Okay, and you might know some other topics. Just brainstorm it, either as a picture, as a bullet point list, however you prefer.
which membranes have you encountered in practice in your, in your experience? Think about that as well, write that in. So I'll give you another minute. Okay, and just before you hand it in, uh, take a photo of it if you want to keep a copy for yourself. <clears throat> Okay, and if you're done, just pass them over to this side, please. Thank you. Ben, even the handwriting looks good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, sure. OK. Anyone else? Oh. Thank you. Thank you. OK, so let's, uh, let's do a run through. Uh, any, any comments, what, any topics you know about membranes already? Let's hear from, from the floor. Nothing, yes? Hemodialysis. Okay, or just dialysis as it's often called. What else do you know? Yeah. Applications in the dairy industry. So application areas, let's add, this list can be Fairly extensive, but dairy industry is one of them. Yeah. Car wash paint, uh, car washes will often use membranes to purify the wastewater. Yeah. CO2 from methane. Okay. Yeah. Middle East uh, desalination. Okay. I'm pretty sure there'll be some interesting uh, posters on that at this afternoon's talk. Desalination is a really busy topic, an active topic of research at the moment. Anything else you know about membranes? Not necessarily application areas. Sorry. Fouling. Fouling. Okay, fouling is a... If you can fix that problem, there's lots of money to be made on there. Expensive to replace and buy. What's the expense due to, primarily? Material. The material, manufacturing, the technology behind it. There's a lot of patents, a lot of, uh, uh, there's a few companies that hold some of the patents and some of the key technologies to manufacture and make the membranes. We won't look at membrane production in this course. We're looking at the use of membranes, but how these are made um, on a large scale, there's a lot of open questions there. So they're, they're expensive. Anything else? Yeah, Brent? Methane from ethylene. In the oil sands, okay, so just another application there, right? They have a molecular weight cutoff, so we're going to see this acronym, molecular weight cutoff, come up in a class or two from now. Yeah. 
selectively permeable. Okay, so there's another term we'll see. Yeah. Reverse osmosis. Okay. Okay, so anyone driven past this, uh, you often see them in the strip malls, RO water. They've got a big signs on their windows. RO water, reverse osmosis water. You can go bring your container and buy water from them. That's membranes being used there for that. Any other topics? Topics that you'd be interested in seeing or hearing related to membranes? MBRs. MBRs. What does that stand for? Membrane bioreactor. Membrane bioreactor, okay. So I'm looking at getting someone from GE to come talk to the class next week. Um, they're, relate, they're, they're a company that does work in MBRs. Anything else? Okay, so we're going to see lots of new terminology, lots of new words come up in this section of the course. So what I um, have here for you is just a list of references. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, so that <clears throat> list of references there is is a really comprehensive one over um, to start from. But Perry's Engineering Handbook contains a lot of good information, and then I'll periodically be referring to some of the other textbooks. And there's a lot of information on membranes freely available online. So we'll um, we'll point to that now. Where are membranes used and why do we study this topic? Well, as I showed you in, in that previous graph, there's a lot of particle sizes that we can separate very easily with centrifuges and cyclones and sedimentation vessels. But finely dispersed solids, solids in the single digit micron size and smaller, those are very tough to separate. Particles that are very finely dispersed and form a gelatinous type texture on a filter paper very quickly clog up a filter paper and, and the, create a cake that is essentially then just totally blocked and can't proceed with filtration anymore. Okay, so you might be tempted to simply use a filter, but a filter press or a filter uh, paper will gel up and not really succeed. So there's a problem there with that and we can overcome that with membranes. Dissolved salts. So sugars, salts, particles that are dissolved fully in the liquid phase, we can't separate that with a filtration step, right? The filtration step is based on size. It's using the size of the molecule to retain it. Um, once you've dissolved that salt, in, it goes through in the filtrate. Non-volatile organics um, are um, another topic that I'll talk a bit more about later on. Biological materials and um, where we really require aseptic operation at ambient temperatures. We can't damage the cell. We can't centrifuge it and break it apart. We cannot sediment it, obviously. Um, biological separations are often very well achieved with membrane devices. Okay. And it's not always true that biological materials can't be centrifuged. Um, sometimes the centrifuge just doesn't get the throughput that we need. Okay, so we showed there on an earlier plot that you can use a lab scale centrifuge to achieve small scale particle separation. But once you need to go to larger flow rates, a centrifuge is not economical anymore and membranes can be now substituted. Okay. Now, your skin is a membrane, right? We, we have this membrane all over our body and it's an efficient way of separating and allowing material to pass through our skin and retaining other material. Um, it's energy efficient, it's effective, but it's slow. Okay, so nature, nature does separations through membranes. I'll show you how nature uses reverse osmosis uh, when we get to that topic, but it's slow. We can accelerate that by a pro providing a high up delta P, a large pressure drop. We can still use the way that nature separates and speed it up a little bit. Okay, so that's uh, that's one way to view membranes. Um, now, from an engineering perspective, membranes are fairly new. 
but their key advantage is that they're saving energy costs and we can use them at ambient temperature conditions, right? So the moment we can work at ambient temperature, that's really, really desirable because to put heat into a system, to raise temperature to get a, an effective separation, what works well for distillation columns and other energy intensive separations, but if we can avoid putting in energy or extreme temperatures, then we, can, um, we, we would prefer that. The other nice thing about membranes is that they're very modular. So here we see a Z-weed module or a cassette as it's sometimes called. It provides a fixed surface area. So this unit provides a fixed area A and if we put two or three or four of them in parallel or in series we can get different uh, configurations working for us depending on our objective. But the nice thing is that it's modular, right? So we can stack them side by side and we can grow this unit as time and demand in increases. It's also very easy to replace. If this unit gets damaged, we don't need to replace the entire unit. We pull out just the single cassette and, and go from there. Now, these are topics up here on this slide that we won't cover in this course, but are extremely challenging in the membrane area from a manufacturing point of view. So what you'll see in, in the next class coming up is that these membranes are extremely thin. Right? And there's a reason for that because we're going to apply high pressure drops across them. We don't want a thick, a thick membrane. Every micrometer that that membrane is thick is a resistance that we have to pass through. So we want to minimize that resistance. We want to reduce the membrane's thickness. But how can we make it withstand high pressures, operate without breaking, and still be thin? So there's a challenge for engineers and scientists going forward. Um, how do we deal with fouling? Sean had mentioned fouling here early, earlier. Fouling and cleaning these membranes is an ongoing topic that companies struggle with. Selectivity. That's directly related to the separation factor. How can we make that membrane selective to one particle size so it retains one particle size but allows other particle sizes through? Okay? And manufacturing these membranes is extremely challenging to get uniform pore sizes. So, um, for example, I dealt with a company a few years ago. They, um, their biggest complaint was that their market share was being eaten up by the Japanese competitor. Their Japanese competitor was able to manufacture pores on the membrane that when you looked at under the microscope were perfectly uniform. In North America they were not able to get that uniformity. Okay, so they were really struggling with that process. So it's an important challenge over there. So topics we won't cover but for those of you that are looking for interesting careers in water and water treatments, there's a lot going here. Okay? So we'll take this up on Friday's class and continue with that.